the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> may Lord and may God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins and the grace to spend this time of prayer fruitfully. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my guardian angel, intercede for me. A branch shall sprout from the root of Jesse, and the glory of the Lord will fill the whole earth, and all flesh will see the salvation of God. We have finally arrived, the week of Christmas. By the end of this week, we shall be celebrating totally celebrating. There will be no, I would say, trace anymore of the penitential note that Advent had brought with it. But there will be only the joyful expectation of the second coming. Joyful, because precisely we have the guarantee that had been brought, that will be brought rather, by the Son of Man, the Son of God made man born amongst us. This week, when we shall be finishing the so called dawn masses that started last week, and I really wish that you had been following the, the homilies and all of the liturgicals shall we say, indications that should have helped us accompany Mary and Joseph and the unborn child in that last sprint towards Bethlehem, still with a note of joyful expectation, definitely, but with this note of penitence, because love seeks union. And we can never forget that that first Christmas was a harsh one. That first Christmas was a painful one but it was also full of love. Because when there is love, even pain, even harshness disappears. So I propose to spend this last three meditations before Christmas, like a tree doom, following very closely the liturgy. I remember St. Jose Maria, the founder of Opus Dei, always encouraging his children, encouraging us to make our prayer liturgical because the liturgy is not there to, I don't know, for show. Mm -hmm. The liturgical indications, the choice of readings, even the way the prayers of the masses have been crafted has been inspired. Of course, like anything else that comes of a council, it is it's inspired by the, but the liturgical renewal brought about by the Second Vatican Council, despite all the confusions that follow thereafter, not the fault of the council, but the fault of the usual suspects, always the troublemakers in the church who try to um, twist the words, sometimes of the Holy Father, many times of the council. Those of you who are old enough will remember the post-conciliar crisis. But if you follow the genuine indications of the Second Vatican Council and of the liturgical renewal, you will, have, you will arrive at the conclusion as I had always arrived, or rather as I had arrived, that it's sublime. Hmm? So we begin with the entrance antiphone, a branch shall sprout from the root of Jesse and the glory of the Lord will fill the whole earth and all flesh will see the salvation of God. Of course, we know what this is referring to, especially when we go to the readings of the Mass of that day, of today. The first reading is taken from the prophet Isaiah. The Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask for a sign from the Lord your God. Let it be deep as the nether world or high as the sky. In other words, since you're going to ask for a sign, ask what you want. But Ahaz answered, I will not ask, I will not tempt the Lord. On the other hand, when we listen to that faith of that man, 
Paul's not even inclined to ask for a sign. Because a man with faith does not ask for signs. A man with faith reads the signs that are already there. Many times people say, I ask for a sign. Give me a sign. And then you, you have to realize that God is speaking to us all the time. It doesn't have to have miraculous signs. What we need to know uh, to do rather is to learn how to recognize divine providence, to recognize the hand of God in the ordinary things of each day without asking, having to ask for anything extraordinary. That's what faith means. And even at the time of our Lord, he was already complaining or chiding the Jews because they were always asking for extraordinary signs. And he was telling them, you know well enough to read the signs of the times, the weather, uh, the, the, the condition of the sun, that it will train, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then how come you cannot treat the signs of divine providence? And of course, the reason for that is very simple. We don't see what we're not prepared to face. We don't realize what we're not prepared to pay the consequences thereof. In Tagalog, we have an expression, but if you're ready, you see things immediately. But Ahaz answered, I will not ask, I will not tempt the Lord. Then Isaiah said, listen, O house of David, Ahaz was the king, remember, and uh, Isaiah was the prophet. O house of David, is it not enough for you to weary men? Must you also weary my God? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you this sign. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. This was the time of Ahaz, very close to the time of David, Isaiah. Um, it was a figure of that other virgin that would come in the fullness of time. which we read in the gospel reading. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming to her, he said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at what was said and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. We contemplate this mystery every day in the Angelus, the mystery of the Annunciation. There's a reference to the sixth month because this is the account of St. Luke. The previous verses had referred to the, <clears throat> the conception, again, another miraculous one, of John the Baptist in Ain Karim, close to Jerusalem. Zachary, who was a priest, was already advanced in years. And so was his wife, Elizabeth. They were cousins of Our Lady, relatives, not first cousins. They must have come from that area of Bethlehem, which was the birthplace of, of David, the town of David about 12 kilometers from, from Jerusalem to the northwest, equidistant, going to the right. If you went to the right, then you'll go towards uh, Emma, Emmaus. And that's where the Saxon Conference Center is, for those of you who've been there. But in any case, um, that event had happened. The same angel Gabriel, Gabriel remember, had appeared to Zachary while Zachary was in the temple telling him that his wife was going to conceive and he didn't believe. What sign will you give me for this, that this is true? And the angel gave him a sign. He was a struck dumb and he couldn't speak until precisely uh, John the Baptist was born. Well, from that account of the mysterious conception or um, uh, uh, pregnancy of Elizabeth, who was already postmenopausal. On the sixth month, meaning to say when John the Baptist was six months old in his mother's womb, this other 
annunciation happens, this time in Nazareth. If the first one was in Ain Karim, close to Jerusalem in the south, in, in Judea, this one was all the way to the north, passing through Samaria to the region of Galilee, where Joseph and Mary and 50 other families from David had immigrated, most probably out of poverty, in a little village called Nazareth. They are tucked there in the hills off the, the main north-south road from Galilee going down to Jericho and up to Jerusalem, to the Dead Sea even. But in any case, uh, and here we're contemplating a wonderful scene. Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. We have been considering this scene in the past, and we consider it once more. Because those words of the angel enshrined a great revelation. Hail, full of grace. He was affirming that Mary was full of grace. Remember, we had considered what grace is. Grace is not another entity that we need to wrap our head around, but rather it's our expression of a reality which is the consequence of a deeper reality which, yes, has entity. And in one breath, the angel reveals both. Hail, full of grace, we can say that she was graceful. She had that quality that made her pleasing to God because the Lord is with her. But wait, this was the beginning of the Annunciation. The word made flesh, the word had not yet been made flesh. That would happen after she says yes. So in other words, from the very beginning, it was already being stated by the angel that she was full of grace and that the Lord was with her. What was the angel referring to? We were considering this during the feast of the Immaculate Conception a short while ago. And the truth is, she was full of grace. She was graceful, pleasing, pleasurable in the eyes of God, precisely because from the first moment of her conception, she had not been subjected to original sin. That's the negative aspect of it. But rather, that she had always enjoyed the presence of God in her. That mysterious roa, that breath that was breathed into our first parents, that was the original design for mankind, that we were not only made from the slime of the earth, evolve into this flesh and blood and this spiritual soul that we have in the image of God, but from the very beginning, that's why the, 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 the word there is, and God made man from the slime of the earth, and not then, but and concomitant, simultaneous with one same creative act. God infused into them the breath of life, that same breath that was moving over the waters of creation, that same breath that had supervised the creation of the material universe, was not only supervising, but informed them from inside. Well, Mary had that prerogative, which we are born without. That's the reason why we need to be baptized, to give it back to us. But what she enjoyed from the first moment of her conception, all in attention to the fact of this moment, this sublime moment when the angel would give her the news, that she was going to be the mother of God. But she was greatly troubled at what she said, what was said rather, and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. Then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. She was perturbed, she was bothered. She was not really afraid, just disturbed. Our lady was 15 or 16 years old when this happened. And you look at a 15 or 16 year old girl right now, and what would she have in her mind? Okay, she's a girl, so she, it, 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 it's not going to be video games like the guys would have. But definitely, 
The word for it in Tagalog is kika, is tough. Hmm? Girly stuff. Our lady at 15 or 16 was already married to Joseph because that's the way those cultures were. Was already mature, ready to take on a family, start a family. But she was troubled, perturbed, because it was totally out of the ordinary. What is, what is this angel saying? I'm full of grace. The Lord is with me. What's that? And then the angel continued, do not be afraid, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. Again, in English, it doesn't mean anything. But Joshua in, in Aramaic means Savior. So he shall be called Savior. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of David, his father. And he will rule over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Any Jew familiar with scripture, and the Jews were familiar with their scripture, the whole Jewish Judaic religion was based on scripture. <clears throat> the law and the prophets. And so she was familiar with what was being said that this savior is going to restore the kingdom of David and that kingdom will prevail forever, will have no end. And that's going to be her son. One can imagine what went on in her young heart. I'm even willing to imagine that every Jewish girl or most Jewish girls of that time must somehow in their heart of hearts or in her heart of art, because every, entertain the thought or the dream or the idea that maybe she could be the one, the chosen one, who would be the mother of the Savior, the one who would restore the kingdom of Israel. But now Our Lady is hearing it, that it was her. Aren't you going to be disturbed somehow or at least uh, shaken? But Our Lady was a prayerful person. She was not shaken because, you know, of fear of the prospects or of, I don't know, resistance to the whole idea. What this server was more practical because she says, <clears throat> but Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I have no relations with a man? How can this be since I'm a virgin? There are some translations of sacred scripture out there, the gospel, that puts this as, how can this be since I have no husband? That's a wrong translation. Because it's not true that she didn't have a husband. She had a husband. She was already married to Joseph. Because in the Jewish tradition, not just Jewish, but that's common in the Middle East, that marriages took place in two stages. The first one was the marriage. They call it the betrothal. Nowadays, betrothals are more like engagements. They can be broken easily. But at that time, a betrothal is equivalent to marriage. They didn't start conjugal life yet. They were more practical. You got married, you got committed, but then you give the husband a little bit of time to prepare the house where you're going to live. And in the second stage, and again, a lot of celebration and fanfare, they carried the the wife bedecked in jewelry and all kinds of things to the new house, the so-called translatio, the translate, the, the conveyance of the bride to the house that the groom has prepared. It was between these two things, these two events, that the Annunciation happened. How can this be? Since I'm a virgin. <clears throat> and the angel said to her in reply, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. That's the great annunciation. That's the great enlightenment. Those are the details that she needed to understand, because when she asked a question, it wasn't to object. Oh, my mother. You're teaching us how our prayer should be. 
how our meditation should be, how these conversations with our Lord should be on a daily basis. We don't come here to twist the hand of God or the arm of God to do what we want. But many people pray that way. Give me this, give me that. Like the old Billy Moko of the, of the children, no? buy me that. We have to realize that <clears throat> the mind of God cannot be changed. God is eternal. Everything that he's going to do, he has always known he will do, or he does. The conjugation of the verb for us, past, present, future, has no meaning in God whatsoever because he's eternal. History just plays out in front of him, but he knows. Not only he knows, he caused it. Of course, taking into consideration our free will. He never causes our free will. He gave us that free will, but we're the one who makes use of it. But he knows and has provided in eternity for all of the moves, all of the permutations. So to ask God to do things, that's not the way our prayer should be, but rather to determine what he wants, to figure out the role he wants us to play. And then to ask for the strength and for the light and for the details so that we can carry it out better. That's what Our Lady did. How can this be? She didn't even ask why should this be? Or even what? She went direct to the point, how? What do you want me to do? And the angel told her, we don't have to do anything. Because in fact, it's the, it's the Blessed Trinity who will do it. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And that's why the one that will be conceived in your womb shall be called the Holy One of God, the Word made flesh, the second person of the Blessed Trinity. You see how that was a Trinitarian act from the very beginning, because all the acts of God towards outside, outside of God, is always common, are always common to the three divine persons. That the distinction of persons only happens in the Trinity with respect to, the, to each other. Father is the Father of the Son, the Son is the Son of the Father, and the Holy Spirit is the mutual love of Father and Son for each other. But everything that goes to the universe, everything that comes to us, it's common to the three divine persons, even if, because of the limitations of language, we tend to ascribe certain operations, certain actions to one of the three divine persons or two. It's because of our mode of knowing, our mode of expression. But we should always know that they're always acting in unison. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. That's why the one that will be conceived shall be called the Son of God. And then the angel says something, the referral. And behold, Elizabeth, your relative, your cousin, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her who is called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Curious side remark. Almost like a bit of gossip. Your cousin Elizabeth, she in her old age, postmenopausal, while she's pregnant. Because nothing can be, shall be impossible with God. In other words, God caused that too. Made that impossible happen. That an old person should conceive in much the same way that you, a virgin, is also, can also conceive. And Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Beautiful scenery, as I said. We can contemplate it every day when we pray the Angelus. And uh, I really recommend that you do. At 12 noon, some others play it at 6 p.m. Doesn't really matter when, but it's good to pray it every day. And to relive, to recreate in your mind this scenario, this scene. Such that when you pray the Hail Marys, you don't only uh, pray the Hail Marys. 
pray the Hail Mary is looking at that scene that you have conjured in your mind of this sublime moment in the history of salvation when everything hung on a balance on the will, on the decision and heart of that young maiden. And what did she do? Fiat, let it be done unto me. It's very important that we realize that Our Lady did not jump into activity. I'll do this. <laughs> There's some people who are like that. You're still telling them uh, what to do. And I remember the founder of Abu's Day saying, there are people, when you tell them something, they're already thinking of five different ways to disobey it, having other solutions, other ideas. But many times even the disobedience is not because they want to do other things, but rather they're not even listening to the instruction. And that's the reason why inadvertently they're not going to follow it because they didn't pay attention to the instruction. They jumped into action. Well, Our Lady listened. As she must have been listening all her life because action has to spring from contemplation. Resolutions, um, uh, what do you call this, uh, operations, actions, must be a fruit of prayer, of considering things in the presence of God, because only that way will we be assured that our actions, our decisions, our resolutions are in fact according to the divine plan, because otherwise we're at risk, not only of acting extra viam, going on an excursion outside of the track, but really, sometimes we can even be against it. We're at least 90 degrees so that we're off. How many lives are less effective than, than what God meant them to be? How many lives are even ruined? People make a mess of their lives. You know, I can't help it. But sometimes in my mind, the, a, a word pops up when I see those kinds of lives. It's kind of harsh. But it's, it's the truth. Losers. And I feel bad when a son of God, when a daughter of God, who, who's supposed to be a winner because God did not make losers on purpose. God wants all of us to be happy. And happiness is a consequence of possessing the good. So that's tantamount to saying if God wants us to be happy, he wants us to possess the good. To reach the fulfillment of our destiny. Not just in heaven, of course, that's the ultimate thing, but even in this life. But alas, people keep on making a mess just because they're not listening. When Our Lady was confronted with that humongous piece of information, first she asked, how? Go into the details, because precisely she was a virgin. But once it was made clear to her, it seems like the answer was very fast. Let it be done unto me according to thy word. There was no hesitation whatsoever. Well, that's not an answer, a knee-jerk reaction of a moment. If she could say fiat, let it be done to me at that moment, was because she had a lot of practice all her life. She had been saying that. That was not the reaction of a moment. It was the disposition of a lifetime. She had always said fiat. Let it be done unto me. Let it be done unto me, according to thy word. What a wonderful formula. What a wonderful plan for a life. Not only of happiness, but precisely of fulfillment. So many people look for happiness. My brothers and sisters, happiness is not a thing that you look for. Happiness is the consequence of, of what? Of possessing the good. And since in this life we can't really possess the ultimate good, that's heaven, then what we have is a relative happiness of knowing that we're in possession, if you can call it that, of the right path. You're following the right path. We're taking a step one day after another. Definitely at times we take missteps. But if we're prayerful, God takes care of that too with an enlightenment in our examination of conscience, with the opportune advice of our spiritual director or in the different means of formation that we attend so that we can rectify. We don't go astray in a bad way overnight. 
So if every day we rectify, we'll be on track. At most, we'll be off by one or two steps. It's when we don't pray. It's when we don't go to confession. It's when we don't go to the means of formation that we go off track little by little every day and we're so off by the end of the month or by the end of the year that it's so painful to come back. Why are we going to do that? That's struggle on a daily basis. To be able to say fiat on a daily basis, even if the fiat sometimes is, Lord, I'm sorry, I got off two tracks there, but help me. The lecture will be done. I'll fix two, two steps. And fixing two steps is relatively easy on a daily basis. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to thy word. Which, by the way, was not followed by crossing her arms like I'm doing right now. And, okay, Lord, do with me as you please. Because as we shall consider in the next meditation, in the very next verses of St. Luke, clearly it would be that he went up, she went up with haste in order to do something about that which seemed like a bit of gossip about her cousin Elizabeth. And that's another mystery that we can contemplate the next time as we wind our way, this time with earnest, in earnest, towards Bethlehem. Let's go to our Blessed Mother, accompany St. Joseph and Our Lady these days. In earnest, in earnest now, because we're just a few days away from that appointment with destiny, which is the birth of our Redeemer. We have a few minutes left to finish the prayer. Thank mm -hmm. you.